Problem number three. Dry winter atmospheric air at one atmosphere, five degrees Celsius and 30% humidity enters an HVAC system at a rate of 10 cubic meters per hour, where it is to be isobarically conditioned to 21 degrees Celsius and 50% humidity. A water line supplies saturated water vapor if necessary. I want to know the heating or cooling rate required to accomplish this process and if water has to be added, how much water has to be added. Like in the previous problem, we have the dollhouse volumetric flow rate here. So we're going to use T1 and V1 to fully define the inlet atmospheric air. We're going to figure out how much energy difference and mass difference it takes to get to this outlet temperature and relative humidity. To figure out if we have heating or cooling and humidification or dehumidification, let's look at this process on a psychrometric chart. So I'm going to start by finding 5 degrees Celsius and 30% relative humidity. There's 5 degrees Celsius and this is 10, this is 20, this is 30. So state one is right here. And then state two is 21 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity, which is going to be right here. So we have movement to the right, which implies heating, and up, which implies humidification. And just like with projectile motion, even though in reality this is going to be more of a process that looks like this, I'm going to split out the X component and Y component and analyze them independently. So I'm going to establish a hypothetical state point here, which is going to serve as the halfway point. So I'm going to call this state one, this state two, and this state three. And the actual process is one to three, but two is a nice stepping stone from one to three. So from one to two, I'm going to model this as simple heating, where I'm just increasing the temperature to the desired temperature. And then from two to three, I'm going to call that humidification with no change in temperature. So I will call this state point W again, and state point W is a saturated vapor. So note that that means we have a separate boiling process that we aren't considering in this analysis. Somewhere water is boiled or evaporated in a humidification system and the resulting vapor is being added into our ductwork to supply the increase in humidity required to go from state one to state three. So I'm splitting them into two separate analyses, one changing just temperature, one changing just omega. So at state one, I know a temperature and relative humidity. That's five degrees Celsius and 30%. State two is just the increase in temperature, therefore omega two is equal to omega one. And T two is equal to T three. T three and phi three are 21 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity. Yep.
So T1 and phi1 fully define state 1 from which I can look up or calculate any psychrometric property that I need. State 3s, T3 and phi3, again fully define state 3 from which I can look up or calculate any psychrometric property that I need. And then the fact that omega2 is equal to omega1 and T2 is equal to T3 fully define state 2 and allows me to look up or calculate anything that I need there. Well, let's start this off with a mass balance and energy balance. I have three different control volumes I can analyze if I choose to. I have the control volume from 1 to 2, which I will call CV1. I have the control volume from 2 to 3, which I will call CV2. And then I could set up a control volume on the process from 1 all the way to 3, if I wanted to. So I have the option of a mass balance on three different control volumes with three different substances, atmospheric air, dry air, or water vapor. Let's start with the dry air in control volume 1. I have an open system operating steadily. There's no opportunities for dry air to enter or exit my system other than state 1 and state 2, which means that m dot a1 is equal to m dot a2, which I can just call m dot a. The water vapor is likewise simple because there's no opportunities for water to exit or enter control volume 1 other than as water vapor at state 1 and state 2. And then from these two quantities, I concluded that omega 1 is equal to omega 2. That's how I was able to define one of my two independent intensive psychrometric properties at state 2. So I can set up a control volume 2 mass balance. I'll start with dry air. The dry air is pretty simple. There's no opportunities for dry air to enter or exit my system except for state 2 and state 3. So I'm going to say m dot a2 is equal to m dot a3, which is just m dot a, again. Now water is the one that's different this time. I have two opportunities for water to enter control volume 2. That's as water vapor at state 2 and as water vapor at state w. Those two sources of entering water have to leave at state 3. And then, for convenience, I can divide by m dot a, at which point this will become m dot w over m dot a is equal to omega 3 minus omega 2. So m dot w is going to equal m dot a multiplied by omega 3 minus omega 2. And if I were to set up a control volume 3, which was the entire analysis from 1 all the way to 3, the combination of control volume 1 plus control volume 2, I would have entering dry air at state 1 and exiting dry air at state 3, which means m dot a1 is equal to m dot a3, and my water vapor would look essentially the same as it does in control volume 2. I would have m dot v1 plus m dot w is equal to m dot v3, which we know anyway because m dot v1 is equal to m dot v2. I have the option of setting up an energy balance on control volume 1 or control volume 2 or the combination of control volume 1 and control volume 2, but let's think about what we actually want. All I asked for, in terms of energy, is the heating or cooling rate. So all I'm looking for is this Q in here, which means if I'm doing as little work as possible to try to answer the question, all I need to do is an energy balance on 1 to 2.
I have an open system operating steadily, so e.in is equal to e.out. I have no opportunities for work. I'm neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy. I have no heat transfer out. Therefore, m.a1h1 plus q.in is equal to m.a2h2. So Q dot in is equal to M dot A times H2 minus H1. And imagine in your mind that I had asked you, hey guys, why is it M dot A1 times H1 and not just M dot 1 H1? And then for you to reply with, because we define the atmospheric air per unit mass of dry air, therefore we need to multiply by the mass of dry air to get it into total energy to combine with the heat transfer in and our energy balance. Okay, glad we're getting good at that. So m dot a times h2 minus h1, we can calculate m dot a if we know the specific volume at state 1 because we have dollhouse volumetric flow rate. We're going to want h1 and we're going to want omega 1. And then at state 2, we're going to want h2 and at state 3, we are going to want omega 3. So I believe I only need those five quantities to answer everything I need for this question. So again, I have two independent intensive psychrometric properties from which I can determine anything that I need, either with the psychrometric calculations or the psychrometric chart. So, would you like to do the lookups on the chart or calculate them by hand? Well, we've done the chart lookups for the previous two example problems, and just to try to underline the point that we shouldn't get too comfortable with those, let's try it with the hand calculations. So I'm going to use T1 and Phi1 to determine the specific volume of dry air at state 1, the specific enthalpy of atmospheric air per unit mass of dry air at state 1, and the humidity ratio at state 1. I'm going to use that humidity ratio with the temperature at state 3 to determine the specific enthalpy at state 2, and then I'm going to use the temperature at state 3 and the relative humidity at state 3 to determine the humidity ratio at state 3. And for that, let's step to another sheet of paper just to pr try to prevent as much of a mess as possible. So let's start with VA1. For VA1, I'm going to take the total volume divided by mass. And that total volume is the volume of the atmospheric air, which is the same as the dry air because of Dalton's law. And the mass is per unit mass of dry air, which means that this is the specific volume of dry air, which is just going to be R air times T divided by the partial pressure of the dry air. And in an effort to reduce how much arithmetic I'm doing, I'm going to write that as P minus PV at state one. R air is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of dry air. T1 is known, P is known, PV at 1 can be determined by recognizing that phi1, the relative humidity at state 1, is the vapor pressure divided by the saturation pressure at state 1. So I need to look up the saturation pressure corresponding to T1, multiply that by my relative humidity at state 1, that'll give me PV1 from which I can calculate the specific volume of state 1. So, PSAT at T1 is going to come from my saturation tables. I have a temperature of 5 degrees Celsius. So at 5 degrees Celsius, I have a saturation pressure of 0 0.00872. And then when I multiply that by my relative humidity of 0 0.3, I will get PV which I can plug in to my calculation. So I will involve my calculator as little as possible. 
because you guys know my calculator. Well, I write that as p phi one times p g one. And then instead of writing the specific gas constant of dry air, I will write the universal gas constant, 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, times T1, which is 5 degrees Celsius converted to Kelvin. And then our pressure was one atmosphere, which is equal to 101.325 kilopascals, which is equal to 1.01. .01 325 bar minus V1, which is 0 0.3, times the saturation pressure, which was 0 0.00872 bar. And then I want that quantity to be in cubic meters per kilogram. So I will write one kilojoule is a thousand joules, which is a thousand Newton times meters. And then a bar is 10 to the fifth Newtons per square meter. Newtons cancel Newtons. Kilojoules cancel kilojoules, kilomoles. Just hang out because I didn't involve the molar mass yet. So to get the specific gas constant, I have to divide by the molar mass of dry air, which comes from table A1, which is 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. And now kilomoles cancel. And then bars cancel. Elvin cancels Kelvin, leaving me with meters and square meters per kilogram which is going to be cubic meters per kilogram. And if you're thinking to yourself, hey John, why aren't you just combining this with the volumetric flow rate to calculate a mass flow rate directly? That would eliminate steps of arithmetic, which I know you're all about. Well, that's true, but my goal here is going to be to determine the specific volume and the specific enthalpy and the specific humidity, i.e. the humidity ratio, so that I can compare them to the chart lookups. So we get, that can't be right. Ah, yes, forgot the 10 to the fifth. This is why I can't talk and type at the same time. I can barely type on this calculator. So we get 0 0.7898, 0 0.7898. Cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. And then let's compare that to the chart lookup. So at state one, we would have gotten, oh, about 0 0.79. Honestly, essentially, exactly 0 0.79. So look, guys, instead of using 0 0.79, we're using 0 0.7899. Much better, right? Much more accurate. Next up, I want H1. H1 is going to be Cp of air times T1 in degrees Celsius plus omega 1 times Hg1, which means that I need humidity ratio first. Humidity ratio is 0 0.622 times PV divided by P minus PV. Well, instead of PV, I'm going to write phi times PG because I'm all about avoiding arithmetic when I can. So PG1 divided by P minus phi1 times PG1. And I just need the proportion on the right to cancel internally. So as long as I plug in bar for everything, 0 0.622 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.00872 divided by 1.01325 minus 0 0.3 times 0 0.00872 gives me a humidity ratio of 0 0.00161.
0.00161 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. That would be 1.6 grams of water per kilogram of dry air. Compare that to the chart, SD1. That's a little bit above the third line from the bottom. So a little bit above the third line from the bottom, might be about here. So we probably would have said about 1.6-ish grams per kilogram. And if you compare our calculated value of 1.61 to what we would have eyeballed, maybe 1.6 or 1.7, that accuracy is what we are expending all of this extra work for. That's why the chart lookups are so okay for these sorts of calculations. CPU of error, 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Again, that comes from table A20. CP of air at 300 Kelvin is 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then we are multiplying by our temperature, which is five. And then because we want to add together these two quantities, I need the zero points to be the same. So I'm using five degrees Celsius, not five converted to Kelvin. And then we're adding in our shiny new omega, which is 0 0.00161. kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. And then we're multiplying by HV, which we are approximating by using HG at five degrees Celsius. So back to the steam tables. We get an HG value of 2510.6. 2510.6 kilojoules per kilogram of H2O. That leaves me with kilojoules per kilogram of dry air because this is the heat capacity of the dry air itself. Which means that I will have... Come on, calculator. You can do this. I believe in you. 1.005 times 5 plus 0 0.00161 times 2510.6. We get an H1 value of 9.067 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Now let's compare that to what we would have gotten on the chart. We would have gotten a number that's off the chart. Well, this line is 10. You can read it down here, by the way, as a pro tip. 9, 8, because it's going to be the same at zero because at zero humidity ratio we have pure dry air for which the h value is going to be 1.005 times the temperature therefore h1 is almost exactly the same as t1 that minor difference is why they aren't exactly on top of each other especially as we get further to the right see over here it's almost half a degree off but it's a good way to keep track of where your enthalpies are. Actually, while I'm rambling like that, H is also written over here on the right side. So if you're trying to follow a line above the chart, this is 120, as opposed to trying to go, oh, I don't know, about 120. Anyway, so we're at, oh, about nine. I mean, it's easy to say that having just calculated the actual quantity, but we probably would have said, well, we're not quite two, so we're not quite eight. They're about halfway between eight and 10, which is about nine kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. Whatever the case, we now have everything we need for state one. We have three fifths of our quantities calculated. So without much ado, let's determine H2. That's CP of air times T2. Plus the humidity ratio at state two times HG at T2. Because T2 is equal to T3, that means we're using 21 degrees Celsius for everything here. And because omega-2 is the same as omega-1, we're using 0 0.00161 again. 
So our H2 calculation goes 1.005 times 21 plus oops, 0 0.00161 times Hg at 21 degrees Celsius, which is 2539.9. Calculator, come on. 2539.9. So we get an H2 value of 25.1943. Kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. So comparing 25.2 to what we would have gotten on the chart, we would have gotten, well, that's about year-ish so we probably would have said maybe 26 maybe depending on our ability to draw a straight line I mean you guys probably have something some straight edge that you can use when you're physically reading the chart I'm using a PDF here so best I can do is draw a straight line and then rotate it and try to get it close to parallel so, like, eh, something like that, maybe? Why are you trying to pop to an angle? See, that's not great. I mean, probably would have said 26 or so. We would have missed out on those 0.8 kilojoules per kilogram. Then at state three, we are trying to determine the humidity ratio at state three. So for the humidity ratio, we have, oh wait, calculator. We have 0 0.622 times the PV value at state three divided by P minus the PV value at state three, which I'm going to substitute in V times PG in an effort to try to reduce the steps of calculation B times PG and state 3 it's a lot of rhyming donations B minus V 3 times PG 3 we we need PG at state 3 which is going to be P sat at 21 degrees Celsius back to our steam tables we get 0 0.02487 bar 0 0.02487 and then p is 1.01325 and as long as the quantity on the right is all in the same units of pressure that will cancel leaving me with a unitless proportion multiplied by the units of 0 0.622 which are kilograms per kilogram so calculator you're needed again 0. Point Nope, not less than or equal to 0 0.622 times V3, which I believe was 0 0.5. Yes, 0 0.5 times 0 0.02, excuse me, 0 0.02487 divided by 1.01325 minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.02487. And I get 0 0.00773. And that's kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air. And if we compare that to what we would have gotten on the chart, this time I can draw an actual straight line. Move that to about there. So had I been reading this, I probably would have said, well, here's seven, here's seven and a half. 7.75 so we're probably about 7.8 and 7.8 versus 7.73 is that enough to matter depends on the circumstance but now that we have those five quantities we can actually calculate what we're trying to do way back over here which you'll remember is what we're actually trying to calculate so instead of mass flow rate of dry air i'm going to calculate Volumetric flow rate divided by specific volume. 
I could combine these together, but this will give me another vector to compare. Actually, I guess it won't because it's a different inlet state. Let's just combine symbolically. So m dot a is the total volume divided by the specific volume of dry air at state one. So in our QN calculation, I guess we're going to need that for the water anyway. Let's just calculate the mass flow rate, guys. We have a volumetric flow rate of 10 cubic meters per hour. And we are dividing by the specific volume that we just calculated, which was over here somewhere, 0 0.78985, 0.78985. cubic meters per kilogram of dry air. Cubic meters are going to cancel cubic meters. One hour is 3,600 seconds. Leaving me with kilograms of dry air per second. We should get a really small number because it's a dollhouse, seven, eight, nine, eight, five times 3,600. And we get 0 0.003517. Kilograms per second. And then we take that number multiplied by our difference in enthalpy. So that would be 0 0.003517 kilojoules, or excuse me, kilograms per second multiplied by H2, which is 25.1943 minus H1, which is 9.067. That's in kilojoules per kilogram of dry air, so the kilograms of dry air will cancel, leaving me with kilojoules per second, and we get 0 0.0567 kilowatts. And I believe I asked for kilowatts. Yep, I did, so. The bestest answer is probably 56.7 watts, but got to circle both. And then the mass flow rate of water required here is going to be 0 0.03517 multiplied by the difference in omegas. Omega 3 we got as 0 0.00773 minus omega 1, which is 0 0.00161. Note that we are taking kilograms of water per kilogram of dry air multiplied by kilograms of dry air per second, which leaves us with kilograms of water per second. I wanted an answer in grams per second, so we actually have to divide that by a thousand. Excuse me, multiply that by a thousand. And we get 0 0.022. grams of water per second. And those are our two answers. It's a shame we didn't look up the psychrometric properties first on the chart and then calculate the quantities so that we could do like a percent error introduced by using the chart. I guess maybe take that as an opportunity to try a percent error calculation on your own.